Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, or good afternoon, or, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're all doing uh, well at home. Um, I hope you've all managed to get dressed this morning and congratulate yourself if you've managed to do that. I certainly do that every day. Uh, what are we doing today? Uh, well, welcome to the fourth Argo, community, Argo Workflows and Events Community Meeting of uh, 2020. Um, we've got a couple of new uh, demos and features coming up today, and we've got a bit of open discussion today because there's a couple of topics we want to uh, talk about at the end of the meeting. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Argo uh, Workflows or Argo Events, Argo Workflows is a container native workflow solution. And Argo Events is um, a container native um, way to uh, trigger things uh, within your, within your uh, cluster. And they're quite often used um, together. So that's why we talk about them in the same community meeting. Today's community meeting is a bit Argo workflows focused, but obviously a lot of people are using um, Argo events will also be use, using Argo workflows. So I hope it's useful. So who are we? Well, my name's Alex. I'm a principal engineer at Intuit working on um, Kubernetes. I was about to use a long fangled word for Kubernetes, but that's what we, we're working on. And I work with um, Bala, Derek, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Jesse, um, on, and Simon, hi Simon, on um, Argo Project, which we are very pleased to have recently been accepted into uh, CNCF. Um, and Argo, is, uh, Argo Project is a group of um, uh, container native Kubernetes solutions. And so the ones you're most likely heard of are Argo Workflows, Argo Events, and uh, Argo CD. Um, we are recording this, um, so people will be able to watch it or share it with your friends afterwards. And if you want to ask questions, there's a couple of different ways to ask questions. One is to ask it in the, in, you know, using your voice, unmute yourself and ask your question. Or you can ask uh, um, in the chat channel that we have uh, here on Zoom. Or if you um, want to have a longer conversation about something, then you obviously you can come and find us on the Argo uh, Slack channel as well. Okay, so the, we're going to have a couple of demos to start with. Um, firstly, uh, Derek is going to do a demo of the new GCP support that's coming in, I think, v2.7. Um, and then Barn's going to give a demonstration of a new type of workflow template that is cluster wide. And again, that I think that's a v2.8 feature. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, you can correct me with that. So, Derek, do you want to just take over, take the con? Yep. Thank you. Can I share the screen? Uh, I think uh, Alex, you need to stop sharing before I do that. Thanks. All right, uh, today I'm going to uh, do an introduction on the new uh, GCP storage artifact support for, in Argo. Uh, we are introducing some new spec for the artifact configuration. Uh, we used to uh, do GCP storage artifact support by using S3 compatible API, and you need to um, configure the interoperability uh, in your GCP console. And people complain they cannot use workload identity if I'm running my workload on GK cluster. So now uh, you can use a new spec to do that. I'm gonna make the demo very quick and then leave more time for the rest topics. Um, we're gonna look at the real example. So can you see my screen? It's a, it's a terminal. Yes, we can. Good. Um, GCP, uh, this one. So uh, the new spec in, in the artifact configurations like this, we used to use F3 here, and now we introduce a DCS. Um, and then uh, what you need to do is configure your, your bucket here, give the bucket name, and then your key, the key is uh, path in your uh, GCP storage to your um, object. And then um, uh, you need to, so before that, you need to create a service account key and download it as a JSON file and store it in Kubernetes uh, secret. 
And then here is a secret reference. Um, for my demo, the name is my GCL credential and the key, the service account key. And if you're running your worker on, on GK cluster and you're using um, worker identity and this, this one, you can, you can just ignore it. It just is not needed. And then in that case, what you need is just a bucket and the key. That's it. Um, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna run this workflow work quickly. Um, but I'm gonna use the other one. Let's say um, the this one um, without the key because I'm I'm running my testing cluster on GKE and then I already configured a worker identity for the service account I'm using. And so um, I'm gonna run this workflow very quickly and then it it downloads um, the a directory from my G G uh, my GCS storage and then uh, you will just uh, do a iOS or R to show yeah. all the file and directories and their direct and their uh, the, the, the the file the folder. Argo submit. Right step. Uh, let's do the Argo. So basically, to print it out uh, on all the files and and sub files, uh, sub directories under the the target that's specified in the in the spec. Um, you can use it as uh, you can use a file or a directory. It automatically check it, and that's it. Any questions for that? Um, I guess, you know, yeah, that's all for my demo. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. If you guys have any questions about that, just obviously drop them in the chat um, or come and find out about it afterwards. I think there's some documentation we have this for Derek, don't we? Like a, a guide or examples? Yes, we do have the um, documentation for how to configure a GCS storage, a GCS artifact in, in, in our cluster. Cool. Do you want to drop that in the chat room so people can um, yes, read yeah. it? Be fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna send the link in the chat room after this. Brilliant. Is that in the current version? Oh, we have a question. Yeah, is this in the current version or which? I think the latest version. We we already support it. Two point seven. Okay, great stuff. Okay, uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, now, Barla is going to give us a demonstration of cluster workflow templates. I won't, I won't spoil this. I think this is a pretty um, cool new feature um, that's going to solve quite a few kind of interesting use cases. And I just want to hand over to Barla to take over and do his. Uh... Yeah. What? Um, are those not going to fill the slide? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to demo the, the new CRD, which we introduced oh. as a cluster level workflow template which is very similar to that workflow template only the difference is that resource is a cluster wide resource cluster scope resource so that I can, you can refer that resource in all the namespace in that cluster the crd spec is exactly same as a workflow template only thing like another kind is a cluster workflow template uh, and basically you know, when you are referring from the workflow, you need to give one more additional flag, which is saying that cluster workflow, sorry, cluster scope equal to true. Then you know, the controller will identify that you know, the reference is a cluster workflow, then it will get it from the cluster workflow resource. Uh, I think, you know, this is the feature, but only thing is like, no, each namespace should have a R back for get list watch for the cluster workflow template, then role binding on the your service account. Then only like, no, the each namespace can access the cluster workflow template. Uh, then probably like, like no, 
the we have a CLI which has a you can create get list and delete and int on the cluster or for template. There is a new command argo cluster dash template, and there is a API support also. So you can programmatically you can create get list up, update delete and link your cluster or flow template and there's a ui we introduce a new section for the cluster or flow template which will list that all the workflow templates on that cluster and you can create it and basically like you can submit as a workflow in your namespace using this cluster or flow template when you're doing that, you need to fill your na namespace and it will submit it as a workflow in your namespace. I think that's all. This this CRD will enable you like you know, create in one place and uh, all the namespace can refer it so that you know, the maintain maintainability of your uh, definition of the workflow will be very simpler when you are offering like a platform as a service. That's all. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So the template is cluster scoped, but the individual workflows are not changed. They're still namespaced objects, like they've always been. Yes, right? correct. Yes, correct. Thank you, Bar. I think that's. Yeah. Um, I think Sam's got one question about camel casing of the variable in the chat. He says, is there a reason the cluster scope field is not camel case? No, it's a camel case. That's my typo, sorry. Great answer. The answer is, it is camel case. Yeah, it is camel case. Okay, thank you very much, Bala. Um, just in case you've got your microphone unmuted and uh, you know your family's in the background, it might be good to just, you know, Double check you're muted. Um, thank you. So thank you, but I think that's quite a neat new feature. We introduced workflow templates, I think, in two four. Is that right, Bala? Yes. Yeah, and this just kind of it kind of really builds upon that, allowing you to use the same templates in uh, multiple different namespaces. You know, more where the templates become more like a, a shared library um, or shared um, uh, resource yeah. across the whole cluster. Yeah. Okay, great. Now we've got a few upcoming features. So this is really an opportunity for you guys. You're not probably going to see any um, much in the way of uh, new code or a demo now. This is really an opportunity to see what we're doing um, coming up and to kind of really, we want to get your feedback on these um, new features. You know, do you think it works in the way that you're, you like? Does it solve your use cases that you're looking to solve? Or, or you know, do you think it needs to be generalized to help better solve some of the use cases you have? Um, we're going to have Simon talking about new depends logic that allows you to do kind of more sophisticated dependencies between steps in your workflows. Um, he's also going to do, maybe we'll get Barlin to do the workflow semaphore feature, which will allow you to prevent two workflows running simultaneously based on some relatively. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then Simon will. Um, Simon will do uh, a demo um, or, or an introduction to container sequences, which is, um, I'm, I'm actually not sure, a better way to improve um, the performance of your workflows and also to make it easier to work with artifacts shared between uh, workflow steps. So Simon, are you ready to take this away? He, he, that's a nod. Yes, I am. Brilliant. Th take it away. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Uh -huh. All right, can you guys see my GitHub screen? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so uh, this essentially, uh, I just wanted to essentially show you guys uh, what quick feature I've been working on and sort of ask for your feedback. Uh, I, we've had many issues uh, arising from, um, arising from very specific edge cases when using DAGs. Uh, so for example, here, uh, there's one uh, where a user has a DAG that is skipped in a one command. Uh, and then after that DAG, after this step is skipped, uh, subsequent dependencies, uh, for example, this dependency that depends on that skip DAG uh, error out or behave sort of with an undefined behavior or unexpectedly. So as a way to sort of mitigate this and also as a way to give 
uh, you guys more control over how uh, your DAG runs. We've sort of enhanced the syntax you can use uh, on a new on a new field called depends. So currently we have dependencies. Uh, dependencies allow you to set uh, tax, tasks uh, at which the current task depends on, um, and that is pretty much it. It, uh, for example, task C can depend on A and B, but it doesn't really allow you to give that complex logic or Maybe you want a task to only uh, proceed if this task failed or if this task failed and, the other, and this other task succeeded. So with this feature, we sort of want to allow you guys to essentially take control of your DAGs. Uh, we currently support uh, all these different states, succeeded, failed, skipped, completed, which means either succeeded or failed or any, which means either completed or skipped. So this sort of, uh, this sort of syntax could alleviate uh, issues uh, such as the one we just saw. Uh, here I have some examples. Uh, so I, I would invite all of you to essentially drop into this uh, PR number 2673, take a look at the spec, uh, comment with any feedback or any use cases that you think this solves or doesn't solve so I can take that into account uh, during the development. Um, let me just check if there are any questions on Zoom. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't think so, but you know, if you've got something you want to feedback on, or any questions about it, please just you know shout out, just raise your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'll just quickly move into container sequences. I don't expect this to take very long since I'm already sharing my screen. Uh, so another, I think I see something in the chat here. Ooh. Oh, Sam asks. Sam asks, am I am I muted? Sam asks, will this uh, will any of this help with steps templates? Uh, as as of uh, as of right now, no. As of right now, this will only work for DAG, because uh, if you think about it, steps is just a very strict definition of a DAG, uh, where subsequent parallel subsequent step groups uh, are essentially depending on all the previous step group steps. Uh, so I would say that steps is a subset of a DAG. Uh, so if it's more of a convenience, uh, it's more of a convenience feature, in my opinion. And if you need that, if you need that much more controlled, uh, you need to work on a DAG. And you can uh, actually using a win condition in the step. Yes. Same thing. All right. Uh, now I want to move on to this other feature. Uh, this will be relatively short because I, we've just started thinking about this and uh, I haven't done any work on this. So this is just more as a way to invite you guys to give some feedback with this as well. Uh, so we are exploring we're exploring this new feature in Kubernetes called ephemeral containers. Uh, essentially, what an ephemeral container is in Kubernetes is normally you wouldn't be, uh, normally when you define a pod in Kubernetes, you have to define all of the containers that run within it. And there is no, there is no way for you to sort of change those containers on the fly or introduce something or make a change. You are, the pod is the atomic unit in Kubernetes. Uh, but this new feature called ephemeral containers uh, has surfaced which allows you to, in some specific, uh, in some specific circumstances, uh, sort of bring up and tear down containers within a pod. Uh, and then we want to explore using this feature to uh, essentially exploit it to be able to run uh, sequences of steps with different containers inside a single pod. So why would this be useful? Uh, mainly, it it allows you guys to run your uh, it, may, it allows you guys to run your sequences that depend on artifacts without necessarily uh, exporting those artifacts to S3 or Mini or something, and then bringing it back to a different step. So essentially, it's a big performance improvement. Uh, this is sort of how I would envision this to run, uh, pretty much similar to a steps template. Uh, hopefully, with it, it's possible in the implementation for you guys to just use your existing workflows to change from steps to sequence. And then the only difference will be that everything will run in a single pod or node, uh, and then you will get an output app. Uh, this is still very much an, only an idea. Uh, I can already think of some uh, some challenges that we might have to run into. Uh, so just don't take any of this for granted. And also, if you if you guys have any ideas of use cases or limitations, please drop into twenty five fifty one. Um, and um, and yeah, just let me hear them. So this is it for me. Let me open the chat to see if there are any questions. Mm 
All right, then I will hand it back to uh, Alex, who will introduce Vala with sequences. Uh, you guys are always welcome to contact me via Slack um, uh, at Simon, and also drop into any of the, these issues. I'd be happy to discuss this more. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I want to kind of just re-emphasize how, I mean, how um, valuable it is to get feedback from the community. It drives, you know, obviously we have we have our own uh, wants and needs that we we can develop, but also kind of knowing what people want out of the software, what their use cases are, is really useful to us. And the best way to do that is really go in, um, create an enhancement proposal inside um, GitHub or an issue. You know, and the more thumbs up an issue has, the more popular it is. So the more attention the world will give it. So your th your thumbs ups are, are genuinely really important. I think we're pretty completely consistent with other uh, open source projects to do it. I, I will say, I think I always say, of course, if there's a feature you really, really, really want, and you know that it's for you, the best way to do it is to obviously um, contribute to open source. You know, right? Develop the feature yourself, and we were, you know, we're going to be doing. I'll be talking a bit more about that later on. Okay. So thank you, Simon. Uh, Bala is now going to talk a bit about workflow semaphores, which is uh, a way to ensure that two um, workflow steps or workflows don't um, run at the same time. So Bala, are you ready to take over? Yep. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. Hi, Akno. There's also another idea about you know, how we can do the concurrency of the workflows. The currently current version of the Argo will support the two level of concurrence. One is like a controller level, which will, which will limit your concurrency workflow execution. And the second one is like a workflow level, which will control your step level concurrency. But if you, if you think about another use case, A, I want to limit the concurrency of the set of the workflows, multiple concurrency groups. In that case, like, you know, we can have like a sum of them group, which will set that concurrency count. Then what are the workflows are referred into that configuration, that workflow will fall into that con con concurrency group. And that concurrency will limit it based on the configuration. So the same thing, like, you know, we can use it for the step level also, the step level, have like a multiple group of concurrency so that I can, in single workflow, you can, you can control the parallel steps in different concurrency limit. That's the idea. So think about the use cases like uh, if you want to control your Elasticsearch connections, like I can, uh, have like a two or three connections concurrently, concurrently you can update the records. That time I can, you can control your elastic search workflows with that group so that you know, only that workflows will be controlled by the concurrency the rest of the workflows will be work executed parallel that was the thought and still we were evaluating we were thinking that new ideas and the new use cases so currently that proposal we were kind of thinking is like a we can have a config map which will have like a key of concurrency then you can refer in your workflow the sum of them reference what is the config config map and what is the key then whenever it's the controller is executing it will look that can the concurrency count based on that you know, it will rate limit that your the particular workflows execution the same thing you can refer in your step so currently here you know, we were going with the template level so that you know, even the multiple, the same step is using a same step is using that the multiple steps are using the same template. It will rate limited based on this configuration. Yep, this is the thought. And we were thinking of mutex also, but the 2.9 we were proceeding with the summer form first, then the mutex is later. If there are more use cases on the mutex, we will implement the mutex also. So please put a thumbs up if you like this feature, comment your use cases or all the things in the issues like a 2550. Thank you. 
Great stuff. Thank you, Barth. Um, obviously, any questions, ask about it. Um, and I'm now going to share my screen with you. Let's see if we can do. Oh, no, we have a we have a question, Barla, from Sam. Uh, Sam uh -huh. asks, when a step is being rate limited by semaphores, what would happen if we attempted to run it? Uh, it should just be pending. It will, it will go to the sleep. It will wait for that, uh, re like, you know, release the lock. Are you talking about uh, workflow or are you talking about the step? Step will be in the, the pending state. Uh, yeah, I would argue that if the semaphore is at the work level, then the workflow remains pending. If the semaphore is at the step level, that step would be marked as will pending. Be yeah, so it's probably worthwhile just noting that the set, there are direct, there are actually two semaphores in this specification, aren't there? One that, that prevents two steps running concurrently, um, which I guess that solves a use case where you perhaps your two steps are using one expensive resource um, that you only have one of, um, and one to lock the workflows for the same kind of reason that you know within that workflow or generally that whole workflow, you don't want that to run at the same time as, an, as another workflow because they're using the same resource. I'll just drop in, I'm going to drop in the issue bar, 2550, I think you said. Yes. Uh, we have another question, Barla, uh, from uh -huh. Eric. Eric asks, uh, can we use variables that are included in the template to limit uh, semaphores to when the, the variable is called with specific workflow level? level? I have a question for Eric. Is this the kind of, um, you know, you, you have a workflow that's quite generic. For example, it checks out a Git repository but that workflow is parameterized on the repository name and you want to only lock them if two workflows or two steps if they're accessing that same you know parameterized resource is that right yeah the thought is, is if you have two um two commits to a git repo and you're executing docker builds in order to minimize your number of runs per that user you would then have it run after the current build finishes i I think I can, uh, the config map you can parameterize. Like you know, th that's a thought. We can we can parameterize that uh, the config the key basically. Yeah, well, I I would say you can parameterize the config map and or the key. key. Um, yes. So those could those values could be coming from a input parameter either to the workflow or to the template itself. Um, mm -hmm. What, what yeah. might be really useful is um, on the issue, if you do have a use case where you think you would use it, list, list that use case. So we can then check to see if your use cases would be solved by, by this, by this problem. And also um, reflectively, we can explain to people when they want to solve your problem, this is how to do it, how to solve that use case, this is how to do it. Will do, thanks Alice and Bob. Uh, okay, any more questions? Five seconds. I think, we're, I think we're good. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so thank you, Barla, for, for doing that. I think that's going to be a cool, cool new feature. I think we're all probably looking forward to it. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a, an Argo Workflows Contributor Workshop we're planning to run. Um, it says in April 22nd, actually, that the, the plan date will be uh, this time next week, 10 a.m. <laughs> on the 22nd of April. Um, we have a lot of people kind of contributing uh, new features and so forth, but what we don't really have is really any kind of formal training to, to, to give to people how to do that. We have a, a contributors guide and we have a, um, we have a, you know, a how to run this locally kind of guide, uh, but we don't have any kind of formal training. So, well, I mean, I'm not saying this is uh, formal training, it's more informal training. So the plan is to run a workshop next week. Uh, to do that. And I, let's, I'll just talk a little bit about what we plan to do in that workshop. So the, the workshop's going to revolve around actually making a code change to Argo workflow. So introducing a new feature. Um, so we're going to have to learn how to do things like how to run the, the latest master code locally on your machine, um, how to do proto generation. So we use um, gRPC to generate our uh, types, our Go types. Um, we'll talk a bit about how to actually make code changes and writing and running unit tests and kind of how to write a good unit test for this. Um, and also we'll talk a bit about debugging, 
how to run the workflow controller in a, in a kind of um, debugging mode, you know, with a debugger connected it so you connect um, breakpoints. Um, we'll also talk about how we write E2E tests. And actually we'll talk a bit about documenting your changes. So that's going to be some of the kind of, kind of stuff to do. The goal of this is to kind of really put you in a position that if you want to become an OSS contributor to Argo workflows, you'll have all the tools that you need to, to, to do that. And you'll be in a really good position to not only have the right kind of conversations about it, um, also to be able to kind of be able to be in a good position to create an issue or raise a PR with your pull request and not to have quite a lot of feedback or changes to that PR requested because you're already being a really, really good well-educated position about how to go and do that and also you'll you'll know that perhaps you've done the things that you need to do to make sure that your code is you know really good and strong that you don't need to make too many requests uh, too many changes to afterwards um there are a few things a few prerequisites if you want to come and join this workshop and i think we have about 20 people coming uh, so far to it and there's a sign up for to conform to complete do that and you'll get a meeting invite, but also that sign up form is a way for you to say, you know, I want to learn about these specific things during the workshop. So it's a good opportunity to do that. And there's a, there's a Slack chat room to join, which is going to be a place for you to be able to talk about the workshop and make ask questions. Um, and obviously install a number of um, software prerequisites. You can probably have a quick guess about what these are. I'm just going to go over them quickly. Some of them you may already have. Um, oh, this is wrong. We don't use DEF anymore. Um, Golang, which is the language you used to use. I, I love writing Go, and there's a really great tutorial um, to learn Go that I think takes about three, took me about three hours to do the tutorial and then be kind of capable in writing and, and running Go. Um, Yarn, so we build the user interface using Yarn and, and React. So if you know React, you'll potentially get to learn a bit about React as a result of this. Docker, obviously, um, and a couple of other tools like um, Customize, Prodocy, and JQ. And the final one that's probably maybe a bit controversial is you'll, you'll need to be, have a Kubernetes <coughs> cluster running. When we do feature development, we people use different things on our team. Um, so myself and Bar use um, a thing called K3D, um, which is, um, I think it stands for Kubernetes on Docker. So basically it runs a container on, on Docker for desktop that um, implements the Kubernetes API and can, then I think it actually uses ContainerD to start its own containers inside Docker. Um, but you can use MIDI queues, whatever, whatever, you know, ever floats your boat. But it's good to kind of run it locally because that makes it easy to do. And there's a couple of other useful tools listed in this guide here as well. Okay. Um, also, obviously, you'll need an IDE. You can use whatever you want to. Um, I prefer IntelliJ. And that's what I've been using for a long time now. And that has, and the, the Ultimate Edition has loads of really great kind of um, code helping advice in it linting you know points out bugs in your code before you even save the file that kind of stuff i know other people use golan uh, you could use vi or mx if you want to you know um won't judge you on that it's fine okay so if you want to sign up for this uh let me just drop the url into the chat room and you can uh have a look at that any questions about this i don't think there'll be any questions Okay, so the last part of our community meeting is really intended for open discussion topics, but you guys have probably heard in the last week or so that um, Argo project has become a CNCF incubator project. And I'd like to ask Mukalik if she wants to, um, you know, just tell people a little bit about what that might mean to Argo and the Argo community. Sure. Um, firstly, thanks everybody uh, for being a community member, for using Argo, for co contributing to Argo. Uh, the reason why Argo directly could go to the incubating project level and didn't have to go through sandbox and then incubating is because of the number of users uh, Argo has. Uh, or like all big, small, all of companies are using Argo. We have more than hundred companies using Argo at large scale. Uh, also based on the number of stars, the number of contributors, the number of releases we have made, uh, all of this led uh, Argo to be in the incubating level directly. Uh, we started the project in 2017 and um, that was Argo workflows. Uh, then we started Argo CD in 2018. We started Argo events uh, in 2018 and then Argo rollouts in 2018 end, I think. Yes. 
So also, um, so what does this mean? Uh, Argo brand, uh, Argo copyright now belongs to CNCF. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll get much more adoption now that it's a part of a standard open source body. Uh, but other than that, the project will be owned and maintained by the same group of people and uh, it will be driven by the community. We shouldn't see any difference over there. Um, um, we, we, uh, the community will still drive the roadmap and the requirements of the project mm -hmm. and Intuit, uh, BlackRock and the other companies who have been driving the project uh, and the community will continue to do it. Uh, any questions? And thanks again. It, we couldn't do it without all of you using and contributing to our goal. Any questions? We started the proposal in uh, October. It took, uh, yeah, more than four or five months to go through all the levels of approval, votes and everything, and now we are in. If you, one thing to point out, if you see in the description of Argo in the CNCF Incubated Projects website, it says CICD. Argo has a bunch of projects, right? This is the first time, I think this is the only project which has bunch of sub projects under the same org and going together as an incubating project. Now there is no category, there was no other category to describe all of these projects together. So right now it's grouped under CICD because people understand that and Argo CD is focused on uh, CD and some of you supposedly even use Argo workflows for CI, but I know a lot of you use Argo workflows for machine learning and data processing and and uh, I wish there was a better way to describe the whole set of projects, but right now it's grouped under CIC. I think that's all I had. Thanks, Makalita. Just clapping on my own here. It's a candle after. I'm just going to drop a link into the chat room. Yes. Um, Thank you. Have a, read a bit more about that. Um, yeah. It is. It's hard to. It's hard to probably describe how much time and effort has gone into this Mukalika. That's pretty, that's pretty yes. fair to say, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. We had to first go through the apps the delivery SIG, then TOC. We had to get everybody's vote, proposal writing. Yeah. It's a whole process, but uh, the whole reason it got in was because of the users. It has got amazing number of users. Thanks everyone. Oh, thank you. Okay. So this is um, a topic we've been discussing internally um, uh, in the in the core development team about do the cadence of the releases. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a little bit of context, and then I really want to kind of ask um, one key question, which will be: Should we be doing them more or less often than than we currently do? Um, so anybody who's been using Argo workflows for some time probably knows that the pr up until around January this year, we typically did a release probably about every three to four months. So, so um, a minor release, a, a, a minor is in, in the three digit release and the minor is the middle number. Um, and so I think, you know, I, people can correct me, two, three and two, four, were the only releases we did in um, 2019. Now, as of December 2019, the team size went from one person to four people. When you've got four people, you can actually do a lot more with that because you know, with a team of four, with a team of one, you're spending a lot of time firefighting and fixing bugs. When, you, when you've got a team of four people, you've got a good opportunity to build lots of new features, and that's what we've been obviously doing. And one of the other things we've done during that period is look to do more release, uh, more um, regular open source releases. So rather than um, doing it when it I guess felt right. We've been doing one every uh, month since we've done two five, two six, and we've just done two seven. And each one of those release cadences is a, a, about a month at the moment. Um, what you probably don't know, I hope you don't know, is that that's not what we do into it internally. Actually, into it, we um, do something quite different to releasing the open source version. What we actually do is um, we um, uh, group our clusters, and we have around a hundred and. 30 clusters. Jesse, is that right? It goes up, it goes up every day. I can't, I can't cope. I think, I think we're currently releasing it. Into about yeah, into it has clusters, probably yeah. 180 clusters and our uh, biggest Argo yeah. CDs. 180. 180 yeah, 180. We don't, I don't think we release workflows to all of them. And what we, what we do for both 
this is this is true for Argo CD and um, Argo workflows. Is we we put each of those clusters into a into a group, and we call those groups Wave One, Wave Two, and Wave Three. And Wave One contains very low risk um, clusters, you know, development environments, E two E environments, that kind of thing. Um, wave uh, Wave Two contains clusters that belong to parts of the organization that are friendly to us. So our, our, ourselves and our colleagues, um, wave three, and this, and this changes by the way, wave three contains some higher risk clusters because for Argo workflows, we tend to run important workflows in pre-production, you know, important, um, training jobs are done in pre-production. So loss of those, those, you know, loss of capability there is actually, you know, in, would actually impact, um, production. And then the final wave is the fourth wave is the production system and that's segregated so we can um, you know keep that one to last and we we aim to do it about on a cycle about a week but it actually tends to be about every two weeks we release the tip of master um, to that first wave we leave it there we gather some data on it and then we release it to the second cluster and third cluster and fourth cluster now why am i why am i telling you guys this well i'm, I'm telling you this is because i want to highlight that that, that actually there are other ways to release Argo workflows, and this is one, one that we, we do ourselves. We try and dog food that code uh, soon. But it also means that we don't actually consume ourselves the open source version. So the only reason we would really do an open source release now is because the, it, we want it uh, to be out there for the community. Um, that's quite a lot of preamble. The question I want to just ask you guys now is should we be doing more or less regular releases? Do you want to have them? Is monthly releases too often for you? Would you rather them every two months or every three months? What would you rather have? Just an open question to everybody in the room. I don't Sorry, know what... are you referring to major releases or, or sort of patch releases as well? Because now it feels like the release cadence is more, more weekly or, or biweekly. So, so obviously just you know, to clarify, the release numbers are typically something like 2.7.1. The first number indicates a it typically indicates a breaking change, and we, we haven't released that. We don't tend to release that one at all. The second one is what we call a, a minor release. That's the one we do on a, a roughly a monthly basis, and that, that's intended to only contain new features. And the third number is the patch number, which is the um, only contains bug fixes. Now, with with the patch numbers, we tend to release them as soon as we have a few bug fixes we, we want to get out, and they typically seem to be about um, I would say weekly is probably about right for those ones. Um, with the, with the minor ones, it's about monthly. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And, and from my opinion, I think the current the current sort of release cadence is perfect. I, I really love it. Uh, it's like Christmas every month and every week when there's a new release. Um, so that's my my personal. Does anybody have any contrary opinions to this? I'd like to hear that them as well. For balance. So for Argo events, it seems to be a much more chaotic release process than Argo workflows is. It's really hard to get a handle on that. Workflows seems fairly sane and simple by comparison. Uh, okay, we don't we don't have Vipav here to talk about that. But maybe maybe I'll we'll take that um, offline with him afterwards. But you, the, am I saying that the thing that you like is the regularity? Uh, the lack of massive changes from one to the next. It's a comprehensible thing at release day. Uh, but the, the, the cadence is nice too. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll take that away and have a think about that. Um, if you I just want to... Alex, if you do it on a monthly schedule, then it allows us to come back and say, hey, should we upgrade to this new version uh, or not? Um, and we know when to come back to look because we might just be doing our normal work and not be checking for a release. Okay, right, that's good. Um, so myself and Jesse um, have engaged a couple of people recently on the talk uh, on the kind of general um, topic of understanding how much workflows cost. Uh, and what we did in version 2.6, I think it was pretty much the last feature merge that was um, add a thing called um, resources duration. 
which is um, appears uh, at a pod level and a workflow level that basically takes the um, amount of um, uh, one that takes the amount of time that the pod ran and multiplies it by the amount of resources that it was requesting. So if it, you know, typically that's you know one gigabyte of RAM and you know x many um, millis of uh, CPU and just presents that as a summary number for the whole workflow. Um, and we had a really interesting conversation with a, co a company recently about um, the differences between requested resources and actually used resources. So you can, you can, uh, you know, with Kubernetes, you can request uh, more or less resource than you actually use. Uh, and we can kind of make a kind of a guess on that. But actually, it's, that's a really difficult thing to go into. There are many kind of things that can go wrong with that. And what we what we don't know, what we haven't asked, and what questions we haven't asked is how, how are people currently doing um, cost optimizations for our workflows. Is there anybody else out in the in the room today who's doing anything like this that could share with us what they are working on? I'm going to be really disappointed if nobody answers. I feel like the ratio of me talking to answers was completely wrong there. Okay, we have. Uh, Okay, thanks. So Omar says we don't do it, but when we will do it, it will uh, be based, I think, on the namespace and label of the pods. Okay. Uh, Amit asks, do you mean who is calculating resource per workflow? I, I think the question I, I'm, I'm really asking is how do you do cost optimization for workflows? And workflows can be very, very expensive to, to run, um, you know, especially if you're doing very large data sets. Um, and we want to kind of know how people are doing that so we can perhaps share that information with the community. Okay, David says you've been using the feature for measuring GPU utilization. Has it been working well for you, David? Okay, this is very helpful. Okay, great stuff. I think we'll uh, move on. Um, does anybody have any topics they want to talk about at the end of the meeting before we close out? Anything you're interested in? Any particular issues you would like an update on? Um, I, I'd like to understand, and this might be sort of why knowledge already discussed, um, but I'm, I'm new to this meeting. So how, how is sort of the process for deciding what you guys work on in terms of feature development? Uh, is, the, you know, is there a, a sort of an intuitive internal roadmap and then you bring in things that sort of the community is asking for? Or is it kind of like we're going to take in all the requests that we think make sense from the community and build it? Or, you know, how, how is that direction sort of set? Um, Makalika, do you want to answer this? Or, or should, do you yeah, want to sure. Um, so obviously, if there is a need, uh, yeah, uh, there's a requirement coming from Intuit, ML, or data processing teams, we will build that uh, without breaking anything else, obviously. Uh, but um, we review all the top issues uh, voted and liked by people, commented on, and we include those as well, uh, whether Intuit is using that feature or not. So far, that's how we have been doing it. Uh, if you all see anything missing, and that's why these community meetings are places or on the Slack channel, if you see there is an important issue which is being ignored, but which will impact everybody, most of the community, which will help most of the community, please uh, highlight those. But the process we follow is we review the issues once a month, we look at the issues with the highest number of votes and uh, likes and comments. And uh, of course, we may also uh, review what into its requirements are. And just to add, like um, we are proposing these ideas as part of this meeting before uh, a lot of times before we start working on them, like case in point, the semaphore stuff, the uh, sequence templates, like those are things that we haven't yet started working on, but that the proposals out there for people to review, um, comment on, and then um, so that it can be um, uh, shaped in a way that um, benefits everyone. And also, if you see the last few uh, uh, releases, 
uh, the, the contribution has been a lot from the non-UT Intuit folks of the community. So it's not that we are just building requirements based on Intuit's need. Uh, it is based on how the issues are prioritized. It's, um, uh, to, to add to what Makalika just said there, um, I think 2.5 had 60 individual contributors to it. Um, our team size is four. So yes. it's six contributors who don't work for Intuit um, contributing features there. Uh, that's unusual. I mean, that was a lot. That was a three months release. T typically, it's more like one quarter yep. core yep. developers and probably three quarters external developers. Um, the workflow semaphores issue was a really interesting one to me because of how popular it was almost immediately when we opened the issue. So somebody opened the issue, I think probably two weeks ago or even a week ago, Jesse, and it had 14 thumbs up from different people at a really rapid bit of time. Um, and, you know, we would have, you know, we opened that issue, but there's clearly a lot of people who want that. And there was a related issue that would, that, that would solve as well. And that got eight, eight thumbs up. So you know, it makes it really, it's, when that happens, it makes it really clear what's a big useful feature to, to people as, as well. And that's why it's so useful. Obviously, there's a the, question. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Uh, do you have any plans to implement the serverless workflow specification? This is from uh, Omar. I don't know if we have, have we? So, um, so I, uh, firstly, I don't think I've seen any issue open by anybody requesting uh, such a specification. So Omar, it would be really helpful if you can open an issue and then we will, uh, yeah, we will, we, we will let the community uh, clarify it. Or if you have more details on what would you like that specification to have, that would be helpful. We, uh, in past, as well as we are also thinking uh, that we need to have a specification on uh, easier stream processing by workflows. And uh, we are thinking, and uh, again, I, I think Bala opened an issue already to get some feedback from the community. Uh, we thought of that, but we didn't think of implementing serverless workflow specification. If you have a need, then can you please open an issue? Say gap delivery has talked about it with Argo. Let me let me look into it and get back. Yeah, it just happened like an hour ago. So it's pretty new. I just saw it also right now. Okay. Okay. Um, Is there any other topics that anybody else would like to talk about today? I did have a question about a, uh, a missing feature. This might be the correct venue. If not, let me know. Um, I came at uh, Argo Workflows having some familiarity with uh, Apache Airflow. Um, and uh, for the most part, Argo is uh, better and has a bigger feature set and such, unless you're trying to hack on like an isolated box, which is nice. But the one missing feature that's kind of bugged me, uh, and this might be intentional, um, in Airflow, you can define a schedule for some ETL job, right? So say like run daily, you can do that with a cron workflow as well. But you can also set something saying, I want that daily uh, job or workflow or whatever to be run every day for the past year, which necessitates creating 365 instances of the workflow. Uh, Is that eventually. a backfill feature of Airflow? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Argo Workflows doesn't have anything like that. You can go and instantiate those instances yourself off of a template or something. But um, why doesn't that exist? Is it is it unethical? Is it because no one wanted it? Um, I would I would say there's although you say Workflows has uh, more features, um, I would actually say um, Airflow is actually more of a comprehensive, a higher level. Um, uh, solution um, because it does include um, more comprehensive scheduling um, of the of airflow jobs or whatever the terminology is um, and this is also the reason why Argo events exists um, so Argo events was 
um, started by BlackRock to address their scheduling needs for uh, triggering workflows based on calendar. They have a calendar um, gateway um, because they need to um, schedule it, but they need to do a calendar of, in addition to like S3. And so events mm -hmm. um, was- It doesn't do back history, right? Yeah, so the, I was just about to mention the backfilling, um, uh, that's not a feature I think uh, that exists in either of workflows or events. Um, but I don't see how it could go into workflows simply because it ha uh, workflows has no concept of um, like, I guess, calendars, right? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think um, events might have a, a place for, for something like that. But as an engine, I think workflows may be, if it may be out of scope. That does not surprise me. Where it ought to fit within the ecosystem is unclear though, if anywhere. Um, right now it's like in the client code that has to handle the, the, the data interpolation stuff. But I'll, if, if you all think that it's needed, uh, can you open a uh, issue? Otherwise, Jesse can also open so that we don't miss it for future. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Is there any other topics that people, uh, so I think we have uh, a question from Christina. Is there any current work on workflows permissioning utilizing IAM roles for SA, I guess that's SME service account in AWS. The reason I'm asking is we are running into an issue where I cannot upload the logs to S3. Um, I will open an issue for that. Uh, so we're talking about specifically artifacts here, Christina, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're sorry. Um, we want to use IAM roles for service accounts um, and we have the def default service account in the namespace that we run the workflow with, and it does everything like the containers can um, access everything they need to the point where it, it has to upload that artifact and that's where it breaks. Ah, okay. And it's a permission based issue. Somebody Our was definitely looking account. at this recently. I think the best thing to do is probably just raise uh, to raise an issue and then we'll uh, take a look at it. But uh, our teams actually use IAM auth for uh, uploading to S3. So um, I'll be surprised if it's broken, but I, I think if it, it sounds like a bug, so I think it needs to be investigated. Okay. Which I'll version are you using, by the way? Uh, we, we were using, um, we just upgraded to the latest, so I haven't tested it because we upgraded yesterday. So I think it was 2.6 as mm. of. And, and then did this regress or, or is this like the first time you're trying it? Uh, it's the first time we're trying it. We just implemented IAM roles for service accounts. Okay. We were using cube to IAM before. Okay. We use KIAM. Uh, but it should be the same. Yeah, Cube 2 IAM was working. Uh, we're looking into um, KIM, uh, but um, this would be preferable just because we don't, um, like when we have multiple containers, we don't want to go and annotate every single one. It's easier to just annotate the service account. Okay. Um, okay, so we have another question from Amit. He says, I was running about large DAG workflows. We currently have more than 300 UI components, which is, uh, which we want to run in a DAG workflow. So I'm assuming by UI component, you mean you're building some UI component. Uh, when you, when I submit the workflow, I get an error caused by XSET D server request is large. And that's wondering if you've got it. Um, the solution for this is a thing called uh, offload node status. Um, basically, um, D has a limit to the size of uh, a workflow, um, 
which is one megabyte, and, and the way to then make it possible to reduce the size of a single workflow between one megabyte is to, is to break it up. Um, one way to do that is to actually use templates for your workflow, so break your workflow up in multiple templates. Um, that's, that's a good first solution. If that doesn't work, then um, you can look into using offload node status, which stores um, some of the data of your large workflows in an SQL database, so you need to configure Postgres or MySQL to, to use that. Simon's just shared a link um, for this in the chat for you, Amit. Uh, so question for the people who run these large, large wide workflows. Do you find the UI usable at all with, with this sort of size of workflows or uh, do you find a CLI useful or is it purely sort of API access? I have tried to run large workflows in the UI and I find that it takes quite a bit of time to render the page. It's not particularly good. I think we are planning um, maybe in about a month's time to try and address some of the issues of running very large workflows. Um, and by very large workflows, I mean workflows with, you know, 500 nodes and each node is a DAG with, you know, uh, 10, uh, 10 steps in it and then that workflow is passing around, you know, multi-gigabyte um, artifacts between um, different uh, between different uh, pods. That's the kind yeah. of thing. I'm about. Um, but it'd be really good to get input from people on the kind of problems that they're having with performance. There's a, there's a number of issues labelled, I think, with scalability in uh, in in the GitHub. So it's really good to get some examples of the kind of things that people are doing on those on those large scales. Yeah, uh, if you guys can add like how many workflows you are running in parallel and each of those workflows having how many steps and any other, uh, like how many, how much memory CPU those steps using. Because uh, people are asking questions about benchmarking. So mm -hmm. it would be good to know how, how large workflows you're running. Uh, so would you want that in the ticket and maybe some data from from CPU usage for the workflow or controller? Yes the, the more we can know about the kind of um, uh, Jobs workloads you're running the, the better really the better able we will be to kind of um, Test to, to the scale that we want to test to um, I don't know if Jesse can speak to this. I don't know if we usually set out expecting you know these workflows this size but we want we definitely want to be able to support them so we are over time but eric has one suggestion we should look at that yeah i was uh, gonna um mention th that so yeah airflow has a feature where you can kind of drill down into um i guess sub tags um i i think uh something like that would be useful in presenting extremely large workflows um i was about to comment that yeah if we for example could collapse um, DAGs or steps or something so that they kind of just appear as a, a, a single thing and then some mechanism to expand those things and, and deep. So, so yeah, like a collapse feature, which only shows the high level thing and then clicking into DAGs and steps to expand those things and, and so on and so forth. But that probably would help go a long way to help people with um, the presentation issue. So we did add a couple of features in um, uh, the UI in 2.6 and some more, more kind of minor UI tweaks in 2.7. If you go to the top right hand corner of the screen, there's now a kind of filter drop down on the, on the view of the DAG and you can choose which ones you want to uh, view in there. There's an option to orientate it horizontally or vertically and an option to um, zoom out um, uh, two times so you can you can you can improve it. I don't know if it scales to you know thousand plus node workflows um, yet, but it certainly should make it easier to view those things. Yeah, and the other thing we could even have maybe some implicit behavior where you know a, a workflow with a hundred nodes plus nodes automatically is collapsed by default versus like um, a smaller workflows which just kind of showed shows us everything. But um, let's let's file an issue for that UI improvement and then uh, check it there. Um, let me, I think we might have an issue. I'm going to ask everybody to add their comments today to that issue if I can find it now.
it's going to almost be so they're all labeled with scalability uh, to identify them just there's quite a few of them here uh, 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 this one this one this is a, this will be a good one to comment on there we go that would be the one to add to your comments too uh yes there we go um yeah we do want to we do want to hear about this i'll probably copy and paste your comments from uh, this as well okay is there any other topics anybody would like to talk about brilliant okay uh i'll let you all get back to you know your work uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you do want to come and talk uh, about something you're doing with Argo, we absolutely love to hear about that kind of stuff. So kind of let me know and um, have a, a have a, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.